Hello, and welcome to the National Book Festival. My name is Rob Casper from the Library of Congress. I'm here with Juan Felipe Herrera and Robert Pinsky, whose feature books at the festival are Every Day We Get More Illegal and At the Foundling Hospital. If you would like to see Juan Felipe and Robert's presentations, log into nationalbookfestival.com. You'll find them both in the Poetry and Prose stage. Welcome, Juan Felipe and Robert, and good to have you both here at the National Book Festival virtually. Thank you so much. Pleasure uh, to be here. I'm nice thrilled to have you as a, as a terrific pairing of Poets Laureate. And my first question is, have you ever done anything under the, um, <clears throat> under the title together? Under that title? Have, yeah, have you ever have you ever done a reading or event as 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 a former or current poets laureate together? Is this the first time? This is the first time, isn't that right, Robert? First time on any stage anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's it right there. Uh, we had dinner together in uh, Palo Alto uh, a couple of years ago, and I I saw a kick, kick ass if I'm allowed to use that expression reading. Uh, <laughs> By, uh, by Juan Felipe. Well, I'm thrilled to have you both here. Uh, to those of you in the audience, please send in questions. I will uh, ask them of our Poets Laureate and try to get to as many as I can in the allotted time. Um, maybe the two of you could talk about your experiences in the position. You know, I really think that, you know, for, I'm gonna mention Rob, uh, I think Robert uh, has done uh, an amazing uh, project, uh, did an amazing project, that video project uh, with poetry and young people and people in general uh, talking about their favorite poem. Uh, I know he's going to talk about that and beyond. Uh, I had a great time, you know, being Poet Laureate and uh, the projects that we did together, uh, the Chicago project with uh, 40 school districts, 40 teachers was incredible. Uh, the workshops at the uh, Poetry Foundation uh, that took that were connected to that project, the uh, Technicolor Adventures of uh, Catalina Neon, uh, where second graders submitted uh, work to uh, to us at the laureate uh, office at the Library of Congress, and uh, how how I received those materials for the creation of that particular title, and uh, and then I just sewed uh, together those uh, their ideas and. Uh, and took off on that, and then they would submit more work for the second chapter and on. I, I really enjoyed uh, the second graders being part of a national project and being writers and having such beautiful exposure and seeing their work up uh, on the on the screen of uh, their computers through the Library of Congress. Uh, I enjoyed that democratic uh, space and, uh, and access that they had and the teachers and librarians. And I, it was beautiful, and they really took it in many directions. And I, I enjoyed uh, the uh, uh, the projects um, bringing the uh, two uh, two poets that I met on the road, uh, you know, reading and presenting throughout the nation. And I, it was called uh, the Laureate Chicas. I saw two very young, uh, I think a ten-year-old, eleven-year-old, and a nine-year-old uh, reading poetry and talking to me about poetry. And I said, what, what poem are you writing? Uh, you mentioned a poem to uh, Elena Medina, Elenita Medina in San Diego, California. And she said, I just wrote a poem for my, my uh, abuelito, to my grandfather. I go, well, what, is, what was it about? Uh, well, it was about how, li how short life is. And I wanted to honor him with a poem and uh, in memory. I said, what, a, what, a, what beautiful uh, concerns you have and putting them into a poem. I said, oh, beautiful. So I came home with that, that feeling of her, of her love and her compassion and of her wisdom. And then I also met Soli Gonzalez in Albuquerque, Nuevo Mexico, New Mexico. And she was just a powerhouse, just getting, standing up there and loving poetry and loving the audience and really very uh, serious about her poetry and poetry in general. And then later I talked to, uh, to you, to Rob Casper at the Library of Congress. And uh, I said, I want to bring those two those two, uh, uh, those two girls with their families to the Library of Congress to present their poetry. I mean, they're ready to get up here and let us talk about Gloria Chicas also, young Latinas and promote their uh, voices and their, uh, their writing and their ideas about literature and get them going 
so that when they go back, they can just pollinate uh, their schools and their communities and also themselves. Uh, that idea came from a meeting uh, at Apple in uh, uh, at the Apple headquarters uh, in California. I had gone to their uh, headquarters and spoken with them. And I met the Apple, I think it was the Tecnologicas, the Technological Chicas, uh, you know, young women that uh, were working on new uh, uh, software for uh, for uh, virtual assistants. I said, I, I like that idea a lot. I love that project as well. And we did many projects. And uh, the Library of Congress is, uh, was uh, so generous with me and the uh, national uh, peoples uh, were very kind. And it was a, a great joy to meet them. And a great joy to have that access to create a new projects for the wider audience of our nation and therefore worldwide. Something I'd like to pick up on that Juan Felipe said was he said that uh, there was so much cooperation from teachers and librarians. This country with its different languages, its many social divisions, its geographical differences, different regional accents, the public schools in particular, but schools, teachers, I think anybody who has had the poet laureate position, uh, I hope one, I know Juan Felipe will agree with me, you discover how many people are doing a very good job for not any glory and no particular tremendous financial gain. And they are going above and beyond. And uh, it's a great friend of poetry and of American culture in general. When I did the favorite poem project, uh, we did these very high grade videos. We're still adding a few now and then uh, at uh, favoritepoem.org. Those five minute videos to get people to be the readers, people of different regions and ethnicities and find people who love poetry. So you could have a family, a California, Cambodian, Cambodian American kid in high school reading a Langston Hughes poem. We had no budget whatsoever for that. Teachers helped us uh, for about 15 years, 15 or 20 years. I did an institute for K-12 teachers based on those videos and we included librarians and they were not all english teachers history teachers art teachers uh and uh we have in those videos i know a record that teachers still use if you want to do a unit on uh war we have the vietnam veteran who has never been able to go to the war wall in washington uh, though he lives in washington and for us, he went and he read Yusuf Komenyak is facing it at the wall. And uh, you would have that kid who reads the Langston Hughes poem and relates it to uh, the state of Cambodia. So I think this is an opportunity to say thank you to teachers and librarians in this yeah, country. Thank you, thank you. They've helped hold us together. And in some ways, their work is worse rewarded and more threatened than ever. And uh, they are very important to us they are super important. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Thank you both for that. Um, uh, I want to touch upon a word you used uh, in describing the the laureateship, uh, and you, you used, Juan Felipe, and you elaborated on Robert, democratic. Uh, Hope uh, yeah. writes in this question about comparing these projects that were so democratic, and I want to expand upon that question to ask about the kind of civic role of the laureateship. I'm very suspicious of it because I, uh, by upbringing and in a way as an American, I'm very suspicious of culture being official, centralized or governmental. So uh, it's important to think of oneself as a participant, uh, not anything like an imperator or arbiter. Uh, one is trying to find out what is there. And I've always maintained that poetry is inherently on a human scale. It's about each person's voice and the voice is one at a time. So that in the nature of the medium of poetry, it's the opposite of a mass medium. 
the small scale that I write for a person's uh, imagined or actual voice and ear uh, that makes it an important civic fact, in my opinion, that this is not part of the entertainment industry. It's not on a mass scale. Uh, we, I'm very glad we showed the videos on the news hour. I'm glad that there have been, you know, tens of thousands of viewings of them. But in some essential way, it says the important thing in this art is the dignity of the individual. Juan Felipe, have we lost you? Are you still there? I'm still here. I'm just listening to Robert. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's it is it is so true what Robert says, you know. It's a very personal uh, uh, relationship uh, with with poetry. And all of us all of us want to uh, all of us have this beautiful voice inside of us and we project it out ideally. And um, so that, that's what that's where it begins to happen, uh, and listening to others, uh, uh, others' voices uh, in a book or in a reading, uh, and also you know there's there's a counterbalance of uh, the collective and the community. Uh, you know, being a Chicano, a, a Mexican uh, migrant, uh, growing up as a Mexican migrant child, I'm still I'm still a Mexican migrant. <laughs> Uh, child inside, and that's my experience. And a man, uh, you always we're always thinking about the center of society. You know, we're always battling with it in one way or another because yes. we live at, we live at the margins. So I'll, when, recommend, I'll recommend in particular uh, the video of a teacher, Glaisma Perez Silva, a teacher in Connecticut. She reads in English and in Spanish. Uh, Julia de Burgos's poem, oh, and she reads it in both languages with such force, mm -hmm. and she teaches multilingual, multi-ethnic kids in a public school in Connecticut, and uh, mm -hmm. the poem is about history. Uh, the poem, that video in the poem makes me think of Stephen Dedalus, so what is history? History, it's a nightmare for which I am trying to awake. <laughs> <laughs> and Uwe de Burgos uh, demonstrates that in that poem that Glaisma Perez Silva reads at favoritepoem.org. Yeah. And I also think uh, often of the Italian poet Eugenio Montale. Oh, Montale. And he's, writing, he's writing about fascism. He has an mm -hmm. essay about fascist poetry, uh, musing basically, there was none. You know, that somehow, something about the art, uh, they couldn't come up with it. He says, one person wrote a poem about Mussolini's hands. There's a little bit, but it was mostly a great vacuum. And that's, that's significant. Yes, Montale. Yes, I lent that book out, Robert. <laughs> no, I never got it back. <laughs> I gotta get back to that. Right. Yeah. You know, he he's, uh, has a lot interesting to say, a, a man who's deeply an artist, and he's lot to say about art and politics in a very cogent way. Yes, yes, yes. You know, the question of power. The question of power is always uh, either chasing us or we're battling with it. Yes. And, and, that's, and that's a good thing, even though sometimes we get lost in that question. I've been pretty tangled up with that question, you know, recently. I thought that's what this new book is all about. Uh, you know, uh, migrants and, uh, and and the power that that's wielded upon them through uh, yeah. the, whole, the whole thing. You know, the border system, crisis, and uh, everything, including that video I'm talking about. Uh, that woman who uh, she's yeah. a Puerto Rican, Kenya originally, yeah. and she can't go back because she has a mission in Connecticut, and. Uh, we're we're at a significant crisis and poetry perhaps is significant in the midst of it there's a lot of poetry you're right it's a lot of poetry uh, coming up uh but i did like the, that reader i did like the reader of that poem in in uh, your video and your project it was a, like you said it was a powerful voice she has 
Uh, and uh, yeah, so and it's all uh, these questions are, are coming out. Right? The poetry is uh, all of a sudden. I, I say, where all the poets? Where all these poets sprout from? I mean, there's just forests of poets. <laughs> and there's just forests of poets. And <laughs> and I remember uh, in terms of the Latino. Uh, uh, you know, fluorescence, uh, if we could call it that, you know, let's call it that, uh, like in the late 60s. And it was, I remember, Alurista and, you know, Montoya and and uh, Elida Vigil. It was, it was a good group. But, it's an yeah. art, it occurs to me that on the large scale, on the national scale, yeah. is similar to when people have, and I know all poets feel this, People ask you to suggest a poem when there's a funeral and there's a wedding. Sure. They reach some important, then these may be people who do not make a habit of picking up Paradise Lost every day or uh, uh, Pablo Neruda every day. And then the emergency is there for the funeral or for yeah. the wedding. There's, hey, I'll use Rob's word, a civic need, need a community need. Then it says, oh, do you have a poem? And in some ways, I think that happens when there's a large scale crisis as well. Yes. Uh, let's go to this. Uh, I remember after 9 11, I, I was laureate, and uh, there was a flood of people asking, What can you read for us? What can you tell us to read? What is the poetry? And um, this happens in times of emergency. Uh, it's. Um, it's like medical care. People suddenly need it, yeah. and uh, God bless it. <laughs> That's right. And the good thing is that we always know where that poem is. You know, we always One have the answers. answers. Yeah. Yeah. We come up with, oh, qué vamos a hacer? Qué vamos a hacer? You know, let's get together. You know, there's a, like you said, there's these life cycles that are important to us: yep. birth, marriage, death, on, and we just come out of the woodwork. Because we, we have that poem in us, and and it's beautiful, uh, and it's a people's poetry, and it's available, and it's good, and it's, it's something that uh, you know we all can do. Uh, my mother would just stand up, you know, some we were just talking in our little trailer or in a little apartment, and all of a sudden she would just stand up and and recite a little poem she remembered from uh, third grade, which was the last grade uh, she attended in El Paso, Texas. But she remembered the, the poem, and most of all, she had the love of poetry, the love of voice, and the love of, of you know, being dramatica or you know, performing. Uh, because women, as you know, as we know, uh, weren't allowed to perform uh, in in the theaters and uh, and present themselves and and express themselves and, and move and dance and perform. Uh, so my mom was one of those women. She wanted to do all those things. So suddenly she burst with a poem. And I love that. And I encourage that. And let's do that. And you mentioned crisis. Uh, I think we've always been in, in a crisis. And uh, like the migrant question, I'll, I'll go back to that. The border question, the LGBTQ question, uh, the women's question, the gender question, uh, the Jewish question, uh, the African-American question, the black question and on the question of color and race and class. So we're always in crisis in a sense. And, uh, and we're, that, those fields and forests of poem, poets uh, are ready to go. Uh, that's so true. And I'm glad uh, you're talking about it. <laughs> well, let me jump in here and ask the question uh, Liddy asks, uh, who and or what first inspired you to write poetry? Uh, my mother, you know, my mother inspired me to write poetry. Uh, I grew up with the songs of the Mexican Revolution as a child. <laughs> Imagine that. And uh, uh, lullabies and Spanish and uh, rhymes and riddles and all the time from, from the, from what, from, from, I don't know, the first uh, 10 minutes, the first 20 minutes, all the way through high school. She was always doing that, and I was always following her and repeating it. And of course, by the time I got to high school, I had my folk song guitar, my Stella, my Stella six-string guitar, twenty-dollar guitar. So I would play those same songs 
and we would sing together, which perhaps one of the most beautiful moments that I had with my mother was to sing together. And I attempted a har harmony, and every now and then I'd get a harmonic line. That was All beautiful. Right, so Thank I got those, those poems from my mom, The Root of Poetry. Happy to have you back, Robert. Uh, yes, well, it just my grade school. I was playing hooky. It happened, <laughs> that happened in high school many times. Uh, but I could hear uh, my eloquent uh, friend, the poet, uh, and I was when I left uh, accidentally. I was going to talk about the poem by Carlos Drummond de Andrade, uh, a poem uh, translated from the uh, uh, Portuguese by Mark Strand, mm -hmm. and how that became one of the poems for 9/11. And it is part of that uh, way we go to poetry when we need something that is both communal and that is, to repeat myself, uh, related to the dignity of the individual. Dignity, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Anita asks uh, if either of you have ever experienced writer's block and how you've overcome it. Every day, <laughs> experiencing it right now. And every day I... Uh, if, if I to go to extremes, I'll pick up something I love and read something I love or listen to music I love. So if I listen to Thelonious Monk or Mozart, or if I read that uh, Strand translation of Carlos Ramon de Andrade, it reminds me why I love poetry. And then I just am accustomed to saying to myself, write something stupid. <laughs> Maybe it will get better. That's right. You stay with it. And you must undergo the humiliation of being stupid or uninteresting. And yeah. the people who stop writing are not the people with the least talent. They're the people with the least, the strange, almost, I guess it is masochistic willingness to say, I'm going to fail in hopes that I can succeed. <laughs> I'm, willing, I'm willing to have the humiliation of something not very good and then maybe it will get good. And to remind myself of what's good, I'll pick up, uh, I'll pick up my anthology, uh, my <laughs> personal anthology, or uh, my one from the video project, American's Favorite Poems, and I'll read, I'll open it at random. Uh, and here's Gerard Manley Hopkins and somebody saying why they like it. So if Hopkins could do it, this neglected, unhappy, miserable, homosexual Jesuit. I'm so lucky. I'm just a straight <laughs> white man in Massachusetts. He wrote a great poem. Maybe even if I write a dumb poem, it can get a little better if I think about him. That's my story of writer block, and it's perpetual. <laughs> oh, that's so true. That's so true. Uh, I'm persecuted by poetry, you know. I can't stop, and uh, and just like Robert says, I, uh, I I think I just don't have that DNA where it says uh, you know, stop for a while, Juan Felipe, and actually notice if it's like a poem that's going to work. I mean, come on, slow down, look at that poem, and and give it its attention. You know, look at it. You know, see what the meter is and its images, and see how it's all working. But I, poetry just persecutes me, pushes me to the next desk, and, and there I am, writing again, scribbling. And then like I, it or not. Huh? Like it or not. <laughs> like it or not. And uh, Catherine Blood, a librarian at the uh, Photographs and Prints at the Library of Congress, says, oh, here's some big paper, and uh, go ahead. And there I go, you know. <laughs> yeah. And she took some uh, photos, I believe, of that. Had a great time together at the uh, with Catherine Blood at the Library of Congress, but that, I'm kind of persecuted by it. You know, I, I have you know stuff. I don't know. This is green ink, and on and on. Uh, but there does come there does come a time, right? There does come a time when you kind of settle in, and that poem uh, really starts starts uh, working out, and and then I just be, I slow down and. I, uh, I see, you know, where it's really uh, saying things, where I get some depth and uh, and stuff that's just extraneous, and I just take it out and yep. give it some time. And it's extraneous day. until it's extraneous until you find a way to have it in. My yeah. prescription for writer's block uh, to students always is: type up with your fingers something you love. Type up your favorite Emily Dickinson. 
That's or great. Rilke or Neruda. And this is my anthology that I have oh, since I was quite young. And uh, at some point, I learned the word processor can arrange them alphabetically. So I can <laughs> open it at random. And here's George Herbert. And here's Allen Ginsberg. Oh, and uh, I, it's like an autobiography, too. And over the years, it's gotten quite thick. And, uh, you know, you're, it's your familiar font. You're sitting in the position of writing. And maybe the poetry gods will say, look at Robert. He typed out an Emily Dickinson poem. Let's reward him. We'll give him a little poem. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing, you know. I, I, I uh, really hadn't considered doing things like that. But, you know, it was, uh, it's a great, great thing to do. Uh, I was listening to a uh, kind of a, a, a Buddhist calligrapher on a podcast from the San Francisco Zen Center. And uh, he was talking about calligraphy. He says, you know, we, we don't write a whole thing when we start learning calligraphy. We don't, you know, all the letters and the big old line. No, 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 no. We just pick one letter and we go over it and over it and over it again. Yeah. And then you know, when we get going, uh, we'll copy a, 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 a poem or a line from yeah. the early Taoists of the third century or fourth century, I believe. And then we do that, you know, slowly, slowly, slowly. And that also connects us with them. You know, that, that repetition and that you get careful. all the ancestors, everybody who's ever made that character yeah. is behind you. And, yes. Uh, I find that if I have a poem by heart, I especially love it if I haven't tried to get it by heart, but I do. So if a poem, a William Carlos Williams poems begin, now they're resting in the fleckless light. Now they're resting in the fleckless light. <laughs> And it's like that character. If I think about it, one consonant, one sound, mm -hmm. resting, fleckless, resting in the fleckless, mm -hmm. and I can just stay with it a while. Mm -hmm. It both calms me down and wakes me up a little bit. Yes. Oh, yeah. that's, oh, that's what it is. And you've written about that in in one of your books, right? Uh, you talk about the accents of the lines and the terms. Yeah. And, uh, and you're right. That's that's what gets us too. It's it's a Bodily, it's a physical art and it's somewhere here yeah. and you can remind yourself of that it's like music or sports it's like music the physical part of it you start to remember it and perhaps you get a little bit better too <laughs> that's right and, and that's what plagues us isn't that true Robert it, this is what we look at this is what we listen to this is where we go Little tiny, you know, little tiny little fragments on a on a, yeah. on a poem or a line, and and there we are listening to it, and there we are looking at it. That's how it's life. That's its life. I don't mean to be anti-intellectual. It's good to hear smart things. It's good to know things, but the heart of the art is in the physical sounds of the words. <sighs> Well, I can't imagine a better place to end. Uh, I didn't get to very many questions. It was just a joy to hear the two of you talk to one another. Um, and I hope that uh, everyone watching takes the opportunity to listen to you read and discuss your poem. Uh, thank you so much, Juan Felipe and Robert. Um, thank you. Poets Laureate Juan Felipe Herrera and Robert Pinsky. Uh, whose latest poetry collections are Every Day We Get More Illegal and at the Foundling Hospital. Please go check out the presentations on the Poetry and Prose stage of the National Book Festival at nationalbookfestival.com.